Ask Girl Anything. This is the show where your questions make the show. If I don't have questions, I don't have a show. My last show was a show about my concert tom kits and miking concert toms from above or below. And I had some examples and I, uh, I did a whole thing on the back end and I had a lot of fun with it. Um, those of you that have been enjoying my concert tom videos know I've been having a lot of fun with the concert toms in the last week. And there are a few more videos left. Um, I've moved the Concert Tom kit back into Studio B. That's where the next group of covers will start to come from. Um, but last weekend I had a lot of fun making covers with that kit. And I'm still making covers with it. Um, so I'm back to the regular Gretsch kit today. And we're going to cover questions that were asked of me after the last October show mostly. I don't know. There may be one or two questions that came in after last week's show. But I don't really think there was much. So let me just jump right in. Um, again, your questions make the show. Um, and let's see where it goes, all right? So the first question comes from Brian Corey, longtime fan and friend. Um, he said, great show, Earl. For next time, I think you said you play in church. If so, do you use a house kit or your own? And if you do play on a house kit, what kind of drums and cymbals do they have? And how do you adjust? Well, great question, Brian. I have had this question before, and I think the last time I had this question, I was playing at a church where I was using the house kit. That's a long time ago. Uh, the church I play at presently, if you follow me on Instagram, by the way, it's Instagram Earl Drum. I don't really hawk that too often, but I think some people have found my channel through my Instagram channel. Um, I periodically, when I'm playing at church, I put a picture of my kit. The kit I use for church, believe it or not, is the one you see in most of the jazz videos where I'm playing a 18 inch Gretsch maple bass drum, and a 12 inch tom or a 10 inch tom as the top rack tom and a 14 by 14 floor tom. And I use the Tama Classic Hardware. And that's the kit I use in church. It'll be any, sim any snare drum of the day and any cymbals of the day I wanna use. Um, but for the most part, that's my, I use my own kit in church. And the reason for that was this year I bought the Tama Classic Hardware for that specific reason to start using that drum kit in church. Because I was using the kit at church, which it was a good kit, but I had to travel three flights of stairs to get the kit up the stairs. And I was about 70 pounds heavier at the time. And that was really tearing me up. Now. I have to be honest, I still have to go about two flights of stairs with this kit, but from the door where I go, um, straight in, it's three trips, and because of that Tama Classic hardware, the hardware is not an issue. What I had before was a kit that was a Yamaha stage series from the 1980s, beautiful sounding kit. Uh, um, one of the guys at the church um, donated the kit to be used for church services and stuff. And um, it's a beautiful Yamaha mahogany kit. And if you know my big 10 by 14 snare drum, that's the stage series lugs on it. That's a Yamaha stage series. And it's a marching drum, but he has a whole kit in that series. And these are beautiful drums. They're actually made in Japan. These are some of the earlier drums made in Japan, not made in China, not with the stage custom logs. This is stage. It's 80s series. And I used to use in church a 22 inch kick, 14 by 22, 8 by 12, uh, four, um, 16 by 16 floor tom. And that would be my kit. And then I would bring a snare drum and cymbals. And then I would bring up this hardware, which was a mis mismatch of hardware, a Yamaha pedal, uh, premier hi-hat stand, some mismatched cymbal stands. And there was always missing you know, wing nuts and uh, any kind of a way of like protecting your cymbals, the rubber on it. So it was such a mis mismatched thing. I used to drive me crazy and then I would fix it. And the next week I'd come back and it'd be missing the wing nuts again, missing the little rubber sleeve. And I got so tired of that that I said to myself, you know what, let's buy the Tama Classic Hardware and use the little kit. And that's what I use, and the kit sounds great. The bass drum's wide open. It's got a kick port on the front end of it. It's got an EMAD head on the back, a single-ply EMAD um, coated. And the kick drum's got a lot of punch to it. I've got a Camco 
pedal with the Rogers beater, the new Rogers pedals, the, the Dynomatic pedals. I bought the beater for it only. It was about 20 bucks. And it allows you to twist to either a felt side or the hard plastic side easily. I can just punch, push down on it. I changed that at will. Um, right now I've got Evans G2 heads on the kit and it sounds great. And I've got the 10 and the 12, and sometimes it'll be the 10, most of the times it's the 12. And that's the kit, and it's in cases over in the corner over there. And my son-in-law plays at another church, because um, my son-in-law plays keys and leads worship and stuff, but he also plays drums. And it's funny, it seems like every Sunday I'm on, he's also on, on playing drums. So he picks the drum kit up at like 7 in the morning, and then he comes back around 1 o'clock, one between one and one thirty, and then he drops the kit off, and then I put it in my car, and then I take it to church where I play at Providencia at five o'clock service. So I have a two o'clock, two thirty rehearsal time, and that's the kit I use for church. So, but I've used a lot of um, backline kits at churches, and truthfully, if the kit was set up in a cage somewhere, I would never bring a drum kit. Um, or if the kit was easily accessible, I probably wouldn't bring a drum kit. Or if the kit had really decent stands and nobody ever stole the parts, I wouldn't, I would bring my drums, you know, I would bring my snare drum and my, my cymbals, like I do at other churches. But um, I find the backline kits are a little hit or miss, so you gotta keep some extra gear, extra things in your stick bag and in your, my, in my backpack I keep it. So I keep things like hi-hat clutches and I keep uh, felts and I keep little rubber sleeves I can put on cymbal stands and I keep a hi-hat clutch um, or two in my bag and keys drum keys and a lot of times the heads are beat up so you, you don't know what you're gonna get I always bring my own snare drum though um, even if they got a snare drum I'll bring my own snare drum because I like my sound of my snare drum and I'll bring my cymbals that's a kind of a signature thing but yeah um, how do I adjust to it I mean I if, I, if I'm called to play drums at a church where they got a kit, I'll mess the kit up until I get it to where I like it. Which means I'll adjust the seat, I'll adjust the um, tom heights, I'll do the best I can to get it to a place where I feel comfortable with it. I don't pull it apart. Sometimes they're five-piece kits, sometimes they're four-piece kits. Uh, rarely are they more than that um, five-piece or four-piece configuration. Sometimes the worst thing is the seat. Sometimes I bring a seat. That's another thing I do. So it all depends. But I hope that answers the question. I, I do deal with backline kits, and you do get what you get. You get stuck with what you get. So I usually ask the worship leader before I do a church gig like that what they have and how what condition the kit's in. So that's my question. But thanks for the question. I appreciate that, Brian. And I appreciate your faithfulness in watching my videos. You comment on just about everything. All right, my next question comes from Kagler... Sakakli, and I just feel like I killed that last name. Sakakli, A K L I, S A K A K L I, Kagler, C A G L A R, Kagler Sakakli. I probably butchered that, by the way. Um, anyhow, yes. Do you? Um, let's see. He didn't say do you. He said you made playing so much fun on this great song. This was on one of my videos. I'm not even sure which video it was. Um, he said, I'm a beginner in drums. What would you recommend to get speed in fills? So how would I build up speed for fills? And I don't know if you can see the, I got a, I got a sample pad over here, but this is a rubber surface. So I figured I would just explain it. The way I would work on speed for fills would be basically the same way anybody would. I would turn a metronome on. Okay, and then I would just start working with a metronome and I would increase the metronome. Now, what would I practice? I would practice patterns like singles. That's my, my favorite pattern to do is one and two and three and four and one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and, and then I would move the metronome up. until I got started screwing up. But I know that would be the top metronome setting and I'd work on that for a while and I'd push it up a little bit further. I'd just start going click at, clicks at a time. I'd probably start with five clicks, 
the first go round as I move it up. And then as I got faster, my hands got faster and it became one click at a time, I'd move it up. Now the next pattern would be doubles. So I might do something like either singles to doubles. That kind of thing. Or I might do doubles to doubles. Right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left. I stink and I don't practice by the way I gotta be honest I don't practice that much I've been playing 45 years so when you get to 45 years of playing it you know, practice becomes something like when you play is how you practice I rarely sit with a pad unless I'm teaching a drum lesson um, another one I'll practice is paradiddles right left right right left right left left I keep going again working with a metronome is very important for building your time and your tempo and it gives you goals to kind of move it up and there are guys that just practice that stuff and then if you want to work on your feet you do the same thing with your feet you work on speeding up your feet with a metronome I had a guy I was doing uh, a book called stick control with and he was a metal drummer I'm not a metal drummer at all really as you can tell by the covers I do and um, but I helped him get his speed up. He would sit there and practice with a metronome, different stickings and patterns. I call them stickings, but it's footings, you know, it's pedals, and work on his speed that way. So those are some basic things I do. Stick Control is a good book to work out of. Um, another thing is to work on, you know, some of my speed around the kit has to do with the way I stick trick the, the kit. And I call it stick tricks in reference to my favorite drummer, Danny Serapin from the band Chicago, who basically did a lot of this kind of stuff. That kind of. And it's all kind of based off of um, paradiddle diddles paradiddles, rolls, five stroke rolls, six stroke rolls. And to be honest, I don't know what I'm doing when I'm doing it. I'm just throwing phrases out right there. I'm just doing, those are kind of like phrases, like common phrases I play. But guys have analyzed my stuff and they say, oh, that's a paradiddle diddle, that's a six stroke roll, that's a five stroke roll you're doing. So if you practice rolls or rudiments, then you start throwing it around the kit, it becomes something else. A guy who's famous for that besides Danny Serafin is another famous drummer of mine, favorite famous drummer of mine, Steve Gadd. And he'll sit there and he'll break out six stroke rolls and five stroke rolls in his patterns. Now, another thing you can do about fills around the kit is the big thing today is linear fills. You hear this term, linear fills. And linear just means one limb at a time. So when I do this particular fill, <laughs> There's, I'm never playing anything at the same time, okay? So my hits are linear in, in, in liking, and it's alternating linear. So that's another type of fill. And there's some guys on YouTube that really break down linear fills, and they love doing linear fills. Um, again, most of my practice and playing was when I was younger. When I was younger, I practiced a lot, just like everybody else. When I was in college, I practiced a lot. But the things I've been working on for the last 25, 30 years is playing gigs with people and music, playing music with people. So a lot of times when I get stuck on something, it's because I haven't practiced the chops stuff. So I haven't built the facility to do certain things. But then I find my workaround that'll make it work. And that's the key here is finding workarounds that make it work for, for you, because that's what you have to do in a musical environment. So a lot of times I will actually simplify things if things are too complex, to, but I'll still make it musically sound right in the music, if that makes sense to you. So those are some ideas, but Stick Control is a good book. I recommend it. George Lawrence Stone is the author.
I recommend working with a metronome. I re recommend working on some rudimental patterns, especially the first five rudiments, you know, open rolls, um, single stroke rolls, paradiddles, you know, and then you just start working it up. And then listen to a lot of guys, and there's tons of material on YouTube. Um, some of the guys I would go to for inspiration would be guys like Steve Smith is one of them. Um, he, you know, but there's a bazillion guys. Tommy Igo's got some good stuff. Sorry, Pat O'Donnell, my friend Pat O'Donnell. Um, you know why. Next question. Pat Bulet. His name is Patrick Bulet. He said, hey, how do you start being a drummer? <laughs> how did you start being a drummer? Oh, how did you start? Sorry about that, Patrick. It was a good question. Um, great question. I actually started being a drummer in sixth grade. Now, I don't consider that... When I talk about playing drum kit, I talk about from 15 on, because I didn't get a drum kit till I was 15. At 14, I played in the stage band at, in high school in freshman year. But my hardest thing in freshman year of stage band was I couldn't play my feet. I couldn't play the, the bass drum. And I was playing this song called Traces. It's an old song uh, by the Classics Four. Do 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 da. Do do da do da da di da. Do do da do da. Do do da da di da da da. Traces. I'm not going to sing it because I'm terrible singing. But the pattern of this song was. Now, pretty simple pattern. But when I was 14 and I didn't have a drum kit home to practice, I would practice my hands on a pad and I had a snare drum. But I couldn't get that pattern for my, the life of me. How I got to play that song in the concert that may i'll still never know but they let me play that one song and when i played it that night all of a sudden my feet came together and it came together like this i didn't sound as good as that but i did have the pattern and that was the beginning of me playing drum kit and then I started playing drum kit at 15. Now, the reason I played drums was in fifth grade, I played clarinet because my grandfather played clarinet and saxophone. By um, sixth grade, I had broken my two front teeth and I couldn't play clarinet anymore because so I had to get my teeth capped and all that stuff. That didn't happen until I was temporary caps at 13 and I think permanent caps at 17 or something. I can't remember. But... Um, anyhow, so I started playing drums and that was the start of my drumming because I wanted to play music and my grandmother bought me a kit at 15. Um, my first drum kit, believe it or not, was right up to a pro level kit. I was playing a Ludwig Blue Vista Light kit. Uh, that's because my grandmother bought it for me, not my mom. And from there, I started practicing and it was 10th grade, 10th grade, sophomore year of high school, and sophomore, junior, and senior high school, I practiced and played to records, mostly Chicago and a bunch of other things, Carpenters, and, you know, I like ballads. I, I was a big ballad guy, Barry Manilow, the Carpenters, the Partridge Family, whatever records were in my house. And then my sister had a whole bunch of 45s, my sister Gina, and I would play all her 45s, so I played Steve Miller Band, and she had Elton John, I'd play Elton John, and I really got into kind of playing the ballad stuff and then started playing the faster stuff with Chicago. And then at 17, senior year of high school, I was in a band called Seaside East and I was playing the Doobie Brothers and Smoke on the Water and Leonard Skinner. I think we did some Leonard Skinner and um, eventually did some Steely Dan. We did the song Asia. We were doing the Rolling Stones, you know, it was, it was just your typical rock band, you know, playing dances and stuff. And then I went and studied music in college. And then I got really exposed to more than just jazz rock of Chicago and Blood, Sweat and Tears. I started listening to jazz, real jazz, playing jazz and stuff. And that was the beginning. So I played in school band. I played in rock bands. I played in my, you know, in my didn't have a basement in my house. Played in my rec room with my stereo. 
and then I went to college and studied. So, and that was where my career really, my music career really began. And by the time I got into college, I started playing gigs with people. And in college, one of the ways I made money was I would do casuals or what we called club dates back then. And I would do weddings. And I, I would play weddings with some of the local guys that would throw bands together to do a wedding for a friend. Or I was playing in this one, I joined the union, the musician's union, and I played with this woman named Junie D who was an accordion player. And it was accordion and saxophone. That was a, quite an instrument, quite a gig to be playing with. We were playing songs like, that's the way, uh-huh, uh-huh, I like it, you know? That's the way, uh-huh, uh-huh, I like it, uh-huh, Disco stuff. I guess disco would have really been... So I was playing disco tunes with an accordion player. Really hip. At 19, 20 years old. <laughs> but anyhow, that was that was my course in college. I studied jazz and I played shows and I did all kinds of reading things and I don't know. Started doing club dates and then I got out of college and got married. And when I got married, I needed to make money, so I played more club dates. I got in a much hipper band. And then eventually, my wife Stephanie, she said, I called her Lucy. I said, I called her Lucy for this story. Lucy said, Lucy, I want to be in the show. That's, she goes, Ricky, I want to be in the show. Lucy, you can't be in the show. But we uh, we worked it out where Lucy got in the show and I started, we opened, we created a band and we had a wedding band and that's how we made money. And it, it was like, I can make more money on the weekends than hanging cable up in the off the telephone poles for people's houses for cable TV going down the street as people are yelling, I want my MTV. So that that's where my... Um, you know, that was where my day gig started playing, you know, being a cable installer and then being a technician and then eventually being a cable trainer and safety guy. And I did that for a long, long time. But during that time, I started playing weddings and stuff. And then I got in a band that did a record in 87. And I was 27 years old and had three kids and went to Nashville and did a record. And that's where my really what I always wanted to be was a studio musician. So it just kind of found my way to where I ended up but um that's kind of my story and from there um you know I chose my day gig to raise my kids and then when I moved to Florida for the big day gig that paid me big bucks we moved down here and I started a studio and I started working on my wife's album and that's how I got into the recording thing I actually started the studio in New Jersey and then moved to Florida and, and finished her album and then moved here to where I live presently, and I built this room where I now have a three-car garage converted into a recording studio. And I've been doing recording now for about 20 years. And I started with tape machines, and I moved to hard disk recording on computers and using Digital Performer and Logic, and the rest is history. And now I make a lot of drum covers, and, um, you know... I play on a lot of people's, I play a lot of people's music. Matter of fact, this week, my church is releasing a song. Um, the album is a, an album called Paradise Hymns. So if you got Spotify or um, Apple Music or even Amazon Music, if you look up Paradise Hymns, and I'm on the new song that's going to be released this week, and I forget what it's called. It's a Christmas song. It's the new Christmas song. I don't even have the name in my head yet because it hasn't come out yet. But I, I just recorded that about a month ago, a month and a half ago, and that's being released on Sunday. So I think Love is King is what it's called, but don't quote me on it. But Paradise Hymns, look that up. And I play with the guys that played on that album. I, I work, I've actually been working on some, I play some percussion on the new, some of the newer stuff. And I've been helping them track this, some of the album here. The other drummers in the church have played on it here in the studio. We tracked some drums. So everything, uh, the last couple cuts, last couple songs released, some of the album was done here. You know, And the last two songs specifically were done here drum-wise. Um, not, not all the stuff, but we all have our own home studios and we all work together. So it's kind of fun. But that's how I got started in music. Thanks for that question, Patrick. Appreciate that. My next question comes from my friend Michael Perry, and Michael, Michael Perry asked me a question. He said, do you hit the bass drum 
in between snare hits or with the snare hits. I ask this because I tend to hit the bass drum in between the snare hits, but I'm noticing that many drummers hit the bass drum in between the snare hits, but they also hit the snare and bass drum together at the same time. Am I doing this wrong or how do you do this? And there's another part to this question, I think. He asked me another part. I'll, I'll do the part one of Michael's first part of the question. Now, Michael, there is no right, right, right or wrong. Matter of fact, it depends on the pattern. The typical pattern that you're talking about that everybody starts out with is one and three on the kick, two and four on the snare. Now, the other way you learn that is four on the floor on the snare, on the, on the kick drum and two and four on the snare. The key to this though, deciding playing together or not together on the kick drum, and the reason why a lot of guys don't play their kick and snare together is because they flam it. So, you hear the flam effect? I'm really working hard to flam it. I've worked, I practice so hard not to flam that, that, that particular pattern, but I'm, I'm trying to accentuate it for you. Trying to mess with the um, back and forth on it and trying to put it on the back side. It's really, I play the way I play. That's one of the things I know about playing in the studio on a lot of things and watching myself be recorded so much. I realize I like to push my bass drum and my snare drum ends up being more on the beat, but sometimes I'm, I'm ahead with the, I'm always pushing. It just, it's just, it's a New York thing I've picked up, you know, and I have to work really hard not to push with a click track. But that click track pushing energy, it's not out, but it's ahead a little, it's like a little ahead. It's not where guys that do studio work like to be. They like to be on the back side of things. It's more the Nashville thing. So I'm really aware of this because I record myself so much, but that's really the problem with playing it together is you don't want to flam it. The kick and the snare have to be dead on with the hi-hat. Otherwise, you've got this beat that doesn't groove. Now, in the old days, groove was always about how you laid your hi-hat and your snare drum and your kick drum together. That's what made your groove. But today we've become so gridded, we think about the grid and what's proper to play with a click and how we play with that. So that's one of the things you gotta look at. Now the second part of your question was, and it said, I don't know. So there's no right or wrong way is the answer to that question. Just saying, so you know, I don't know if I answered it or not. Um, I played both. Sometimes I play without it. Depends on the pattern I'm playing is really the answer to the question. Um, also, please explain why a person uses an open and closed, uses why the way a person can use to open and close a hi-hat, for example, the lope sound. For example, the best way to use the hi-hat pedal with the heel down or heel up. Hit the hi-hat first, then bring down the hi-hat foot and create a good lope sound. I hope you understand what I'm asking for, okay? Well, lope I don't equate to how I play the hi-hat foot. Lope I equate to the, the accent of the hi-hat pattern. That's a lope. I'm accenting. That's, that hi-hat's got a lope to it. Now, as far as open and closed, um, I do it both ways, by the way. I just looked at my foot right there, and just opening and closing. Sometimes my heel's up, sometimes my heel's down. I don't know if there's a right or wrong way. It's what I'm feeling. What, what you will notice if you watch some of the shots from this side, when I do drum covers from this side, is sometimes you'll watch my feet and what they do. And I play heel up sometimes on the bass drum. I play heel down sometimes, depending on the sound I'm trying to get. I bury the beater, and sometimes I don't bury the beater. It all depends on what I'm trying to get sound-wise a lot of times. My hi-hat, though, if you watch my hi-hat foot, my hi-hat foot's going up and down all the time. 
that's one of the things. So when I shoot from up top, sometimes you can watch my foot, um, my foot going up and down. So I have a tendency to keep time with my foot, even when I'm not playing it. My, my foot's going up and down. So a lot of times, I'll, I'll actually have my foot off, my heel off of the pedal, but other times, my heel can be down and I can do the same open effect. So I don't know if that's giving you the answer you want. I don't think there's a right or wrong way. Um, that's one of the funny things about drumming. There's really not right or wrong ways. There's, there's ways that give you better technique and allow you to facilitate more. But once you learn a way to work around something, a lot of times you can't break that habit, especially when you're playing 45 years. So it's like my hands. I, 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 since I've been recording myself on video, I realize I don't keep my fingers like this. When I teach a kid to play drums, I say, play it like this. But when I'm playing on the ride cymbal, I watch my finger come out. <laughs> it like, comes out like that. So all of a sudden, I realize I'm holding the stick a lot of times right there. And I, watch, I actually watch my finger point out. If you watch on some of my videos, you'll actually see my finger pointing out. Is that the right way to play? No, probably not. But does it work for me? Yep. And have I seen pro guys have the same problem? I have. I've actually seen watched guys. Now, you won't see that in Steve Smith. Steve Smith's going to play perfect, and he's got great perfect technique. Weckl's got perfect technique. Um, I think Vinny's got perfect technique, but I mean, if you talk to Vinny, he probably would tell you where his problems are. And they all would probably tell you what problems they deal with. You know, it's the, the interesting thing. Um, so just some thoughts there, some thoughts to think about. But I don't think there's a right or wrong way for your feet up, heel down or heel up. It's, it's For me, it's what it is, you know. I tend to play heel up on my hi-hat, and I tend to play heel up on my bass drum, unless I'm playing jazz. Then, when I'm doing these squishy stuff, it's usually my heels down. That's another thing I like to do is dance on the pedal. I kind of, I kind of throw my heel into it and kind of get a little bit of that. So you're kind of doing the disco thing. Just thinking of one of those patterns. That's all toe heel, toe heel something I used to practice at one point in time. It comes out in my playing in the weirdest times. It's when I want it, when I hear something in my play and I'm playing something, I hear something every once in a while that I slip that in. Some days I can't even do it, but other days it just slips in. So things you practice when you're young that you remember. So I hope that helps you, Michael. Um, next question is from my friend, Tim Drum Bragg. He said, um, let's see what he said. He said, perhaps for the next Ask Girl Anything, what is the etiquette with doing drum covers? How loud do you have the drums in comparison to the backing track? Obviously, I guess, obvious, I guess, but I, what happens to the drums is you are playing over them. You're playing over. Is there ever a discordant mismatch? What disclaimers do you, do you need to put out and where do you source the song information from? What kind, and that, that kind of stuff. Sounds like he's asking me a few questions here. He's getting ready to do some rock covers. I occasionally do covers where I'm covering over the drummer. I will say that's the hardest things to mix over and the drums end up being louder than the other drummer. That's the key to the whole thing. Um, how do you mix the other drummer out? You don't. And that's where um, CCM drummer Matthew Jackson would tell me, you got to play it exact. So play it exact. Learn all the parts exact. Which is what I tried to do with some of the Carpenter stuff I did recently. Only yesterday, I spent a lot of time trying to get it right because those toms were so stinking loud. No matter how I mixed it, I couldn't get rid of Hal Blaine's toms. But I have developed a couple techniques where I pull the track back and I play over top of it. And I punch the toms through. So some of my mixes, I actually bury it pretty good. But I don't bury it completely. 
Um, I don't think it's possible to bury it completely. It's better to use drumless tracks. Drumless tracks give you a lot of freedom, but a lot of the drumless tracks don't have clicks on it. So now you're playing with the track, and if you have the ear to kind of feel where the track's going, or you've played these songs before many times, it's easy to do. Um, I just did a couple songs that were drumless. Uh, one was a 38 special song, another one was um, uh, uh, Tommy Two-Tone song. Jenny, I know your number, uh, 8675309. Anyhow, I, I was goofing with it. I didn't really like the way it came out. I don't think that one's going to come out the way I did it. But there was no click, so I had to really kind of learn it to where it, learn to follow the track. And once I learn to follow the track and I nail it, then I'm in time with it. I'm cool with a, with a drumless track. With a drum on track, then you've got to bury it in the mix, and you've got to almost play some of it exact, like patterns and stuff. You have some liberties, but you can't be super, you can't take super liberties with it. So those are things you want to think about. As far as sourcing music, my trick with YouTube is I upload everything into private mode. And if Google wants to slap me hard, I will get emails, nasty emails from them saying, you must take this down. Um, doesn't happen often, it's happened a few times. But it has saved me from getting the, the all terrible YouTube strike. I will tell you, I am way more daring and fearless than a lot of guys, and I have had less problems than a lot of guys. Now, I open my mouth, I could be having all kinds of problems right now, for all I know. Um, you have to look at your Google Mail to figure that out. Usually, you get a nasty letter with each, each cover you do. It says, hey, you don't own this material, and because you don't own this material, you know we're going to let you use it, but we're going to run ads on it. Okay, run ads on it. I don't care. Um, the only thing I run ads on that I make any money on is Ask Girl Anything or Drum Talk. Something where it's a video where I own the content. Any drum cover you don't own the content, so they could take you down on those. Be aware of that. Um, there is a way in YouTube Studio to source what music you can use, but I, I don't ever do it. I never do it. I always just find out after I post it, but just post it in private mode not public mode because if you put it in public mode and you you send it out they get mad at you you'll get a copyright strike something to think about all right and the last one comes from my friend chur dolly i do dewey chur dewey drummer boy i i sure i i mess you up all the time he's one of my longest subscribers I've had him for years. It's, he was like he was before I had a hundred subscribers. He was he found me. I found him. We subbed each other, um, and he he mentioned something in one of the last videos I did, and he said this, and I think he hit on the, the infamous question I get from so many people: is why do you play with the butt end of your stick on your left hand? Why do you play this way? Why not this way? Why this way? And I think he answered the question better than I ever have, so I'm going to read it. He said, I think you described the truth of the butt end. Uh, uh, hold on a second. That's me, my answer to him. He said, hey, Earl, this kid has made you, was made for the song. It's the concert Tom kid. Maybe a silly question, but does playing the snare with the butt end of the stick change the way you play? Maybe more aggressive? And I think that is really the key to why I play the stick butt end, is I get a more aggressive snare sound. I always talk about it being the sound, but I think it's that aggressive slap and snare sound that I get, and it gives me that aggression comes out, because I feel like I'm beating with a club, as opposed to beating with the tip of the stick. Um, I do play occasionally like this, and I can play like this, but 90% of the time, I flip the stick over and go this way, even when I'm playing... I'm doing a jazz thing. I'm still laying into a. I've had guys say, "Why you? All of a sudden, you went from this traditional to butt into the stick. What the heck was that all about? It's a, you're playing this light jazz thing. It's just what I felt at that moment. I think it's the section. That's the section of the song where I feel the it needs a little something, and I pull it out. So I think that is the critical piece. It has to do with the level of aggression I want to come out of that snare drum 
and be in the track and be part of the song. It's a musical choice. So really what I do is I play drums to make a musical statement. So I think Chur got me and I think that's exactly the answer to it. And I said to him, I said, you know, I think you described the truth of the butt end of the left hand stick thing for me. It's an attitude thing as well as, you know, being something is just a habit for me. So it's a habit. Anyhow, those are all the questions I got for this Ask Girl Anything. I hope you enjoyed the show. I had a lot of fun today doing it. Um, when I when I send it out and, you know, I hope all, a lot of people watch it, you know. Um, again, like I've been saying to people, you know, YouTube right now is part of my life. I love making covers. I made a lot last week with the drum kit. Changing those heads gave me something to play for. Plus, it was a four-day weekend. But um, I have to say that YouTube, I don't, I'm not spending as much time on YouTube watching stuff as I used to. But if I cap, catch one of your videos and I comment on it, you can bet I looked at it a little bit and wanted to give you some encouragement. So thank you for those who encourage me on a daily basis. I do appreciate it. Um, remember, this show is all about your questions. The more questions you ask, the more likely I am to have a show. If I don't have questions, I don't have a show. So I want to thank you all for asking questions. Thank you for watching Ask Girl Anything. You guys all have a blessed and happy holiday season. I will most likely see you next in the new year, unless some, unless I get a ton of questions before and I feel the need to do it during the Christmas break. But other than that, thank you for watching in 2019. And I hope and pray that you have a happy holiday season. A Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa whatever else you might be celebrating and that you spend time and enjoy your family because you never know what, when you're not going to have them there to enjoy. So enjoy your family and love the people you're with and take the time to share your love with them. Because the love you take is the love you make. Somebody in the comments tell me where that came from. It's pretty simple. Anyhow, God bless you all. Have a merry, happy, merry Christmas and a happy holidays. And I'll see you next time. Thank you.